Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Coach Baseball Right podcast. I'm your host and founder of Coach Baseball Right, Steve Nicolarat. Join us as we go inside, outside, and all around baseball, discussing how to coach baseball the right way. Six million car accidents occur each year. You've taken the precautions, but we all know that accidents still happen. Your seatbelt won't release. You smell gasoline. What's your plan to safely escape an accident? Be prepared with Sabre's new Safe Escape, the only three-in-one car tool of its kind. The Safe Escape features a safe belt cutter, a stainless steel glass breaker, and maximum strength pepper gel. Whether you're driving to practice or on a family road trip, protect yourself, your team, and your loved ones with Sabre's Safe Escape. Available now on SabreRed.com. That's SabreRed.com. Coaches, get 10% off with offer code PLAYBALL. In today's Coach Baseball Rights podcast, I'm really excited to share with you our interview with Keith Gutton, head baseball coach at Missouri State University. Keith is one of the most successful baseball coaches in Missouri Valley Conference history. He began his MSU head coaching career in 1983 and has spent the past 35 seasons building the Bears into one of the top programs in the country. Under Gutton, The Bears have won 61% of their games, averaging 35 victories a year and racking up 11 different 40-win seasons. I am really excited to share with you Keith's journey to Missouri State, his thoughts on recruiting, and how he feels about the state of youth baseball today. Sit back and enjoy our conversation with one of the most successful coaches in college baseball today, Keith Gutton. Hi, everybody. We are here with Keith Gutton, head baseball coach at Missouri State University. Keith, thanks so much for being on the Coach Baseball Right podcast. Good to be with you, Steve. Hey, Keith, our Coach Baseball Right program is all about helping organizations, coaches, and parents transform baseball experiences and developments. We started this podcast to allow our listeners to hear different perspectives on coaching baseball the right way. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, so I'm sitting here, and I am looking at your resume. Now, let me just go over this with you. 35 years. That's actually starting my 37th, Steve. 37th? This will begin three weeks from Friday. We'll start our my 37th season at Missouri State as head coach. That is awesome. And 61% win, 11 40 win seasons, you are sixth in wins among active Division I coaches. You've had 121 kids go pro, 17 players have played in the big leagues, 17 conference titles. Is that accurate? I think if you combine the tournament and the regular season, uh, I believe that's in the neighborhood. Ten NCAA tourney appearances a College World Series appearance in 2003, and 62 players, all Valley, all academic teams since 1992. That is unbelievable. That is. is I might have had a little influence, Steve, on them, but I don't know how much I had on the academic part. (laughs) Well, hey, you've got to be getting... Other than the support. (laughs) Well, you've got to be getting the right guys in your program, though. Well, that's, that's... You said it perfectly right there. It's the right people it's not necessarily the blue chip guys it's not necessarily about having three guys at every position i've been really fortunate to have continuity on our coaching staff i had brent thomas as an assistant for 32 years Paul Evans, who you know steve has been with me 30 years and that that to me is extremely important in our program the continuity Hey, let's go back to the beginning. Tell me a little bit about your baseball journey and how you arrived at Missouri State. Well, the first thing was I I played at Mineral Area Junior College, and then I came to Missouri State to play. A gentleman named Bill Rowe, he came up in 
spring of 75 and scouted the junior college tournament, which we were hosting actually. And I think the intent, his intent was to recruit our catcher at Mineral Area was actually my roommate. And his name was Jerry Post. And he went to South Alabama and hit 22 home runs and got drafted. And I came to Missouri State, might have hit two home runs and wasn't drafted. So he came out with he came out with the short end of the stick on the player. But I hung around. I was like a graduate assistant volunteer for him three and a half years. Went to Ren Lake in Illinois, Southern Illinois, with my buddy Kirk Champion, who was the head coach for one semester. And then summer of '82, Bill Rowe called me midsummer, and I was just single, trying to keep my head above water. I was working a liquor warehouse. I was the weekend security yard um, on campus, no gun, and some other odd jobs. And he said, hey, it looks like our athletic director is going to re- probably going to get the job. I want you to come back be the head coach. So I said, well, hang on. I'm working at a liquor warehouse. What sounds better? So he <laughs> calls me back the week before school is starting. Last week, August, said, hey, Coach Steven retired. I'm the AD. You're the coach. So I was fortunate. That was a really short interview, and I got lucky. Didn't have many belongings. Drove them back in my car and settled in. Been there ever since. Wow, what a great story. Now tell me a little bit about about Bill Rowe. I mean, uh, I've met Bill in the past. Uh, I remember in the old days when I used to officiate, I ran across Bill, and we have mutual friends, and I hear so many wonderful things about him. Well, they're all true. I mean, this this is the guy that was my coach. I was his assistant, and he was my AD, Steve, up until uh, nine years ago. So he was with Missouri State, which started out of southwest Missouri State. He himself was there 47 years in athletics. And, you know, you just – he's in it. He cared about the players. He did it right. And, uh, you know, he influenced a lot, a lot of people, certainly not just in athletics, but anybody that came in contact with him. Fortunately, still around, helps us fundraise, involved, and a great supporter of our program. And our indoor training facility bears his name. That's awesome. Hey, Keith, what other coaches or people have influenced you in your in your coaching journey? I'd say Bill Rowe, first and foremost, as my coach. And then when I was his assistant, then I worked for him as athletic director. I'd say Hal Lowry was my junior college coach at Mineral Area and helped me get to Southwest. So I would say those two primarily. What I've tried to do, Steve, is look at coaches in other sports, in amateur sports, in professional sports, and and try to look at successful people and see what they're doing. What are their common characteristics? And, you know, I've kind of come up with my own philosophy of what makes people successful and and tried to follow that. Now, I'm going to throw you a softball here, okay? So... When when you recruit to Missouri State, what is it when you what is it that you tell a recruit that makes your school your program so attractive? Well, I think you know you, you always try to sell your own place and never you know uh, say anything negative regarding anybody else. I think from a baseball perspective, we have a winning tradition here that started long before I got here, and I give credit to that. We have great assistant coaches. We've had a lot of continuity, as I said, with with Paul and Brent. We have a young man that played for us named Matt Lawson, who's now our hitting coach and recruiting coordinator. He played up to AAA. We're we're actually up to 20 big leaguers right now, Steve. But I bet bet 14 have been pitchers. And Paul's done a terrific job in developing pitching here. And he has complete autonomy. I give him over the staff. He names a starter. He makes the end games move. Now, it took me 27 years to get to the point where I did that, and not that I didn't trust him. It's just it's hard to let things go. But I, I just sell our assistant coaches in terms of development. And we have a great facility because we are able to share the St. Louis Cardinals AA facility with the Springfield Cardinals, and it's first class. We have an indoor training place, and then, you know, we feel like our academics are very, very good as well, particularly our College of Business and our education department. It's a wonderful setup you have there, and I can certainly understand why kids who uh, who want to play baseball wind up going to your school. I mean, what a what a great situation you have. Now, I want to I want to talk to you just a second about something I've noticed 
um, in my years of coaching, I've noticed a, sort of a change in the, the recruiting process. Many college coaches now don't really communicate so much with the high school coach. It seems like they recruit from other sources, showcase events, tournaments, camps. Would you agree with that? Would you say that's fairly accurate? Do you do it I that way? I think it way? is, Steve. And, you know, it's just kind of the trend maybe the last 15 years that there seems to be so much travel, select, <clears throat> baseball, some showcases, workouts in the summer. And, you know, we play 60 games in the spring, so it makes it more difficult to travel, really see kids in the spring. <clears throat> so you're seeing them primarily in the summer and a little bit in the fall. I think, you know, Certainly, early on, I haven't done as good a job lately as as maybe I did in the early years. When we were recruiting a, a high school kid, I used to try to make sure I made contact with the high school coach. Now, not not as much anymore, honestly. Now, if I know the coach, I certainly want to keep him in the loop and communicate with him. If I was recruiting a player at St. Louis University High School and you were there. I would be talking to you, but if it, but if it's a guy six states away and I don't know him, I probably don't do a very good job on that. So it, it's changed significantly. How how do you get that that little extra piece of information about a borderline recruit um, that that maybe could be helpful in you in your final determination? Well, you're trying to find somebody that you trust that has knowledge or a connection with that young man. I mean, I go see a guy in the summer. I told us we had camp yesterday. The last thing when I was talking to the guys before they left, I said, the first thing I'm going to do when I find somebody that I think can play at the level we play at is I'm going to get their academic transcript. I'm not going to ask them how their grades are because if they're actually a 3-4, they're going to tell me a 3-6. If they're a 2-4, they're going to tell me a 2-6. So I want the transcript. The transcript doesn't lie. I need to see if they're going to be able to have made it and can make it at the university level academically. I need to know their test score. I also need to know their tardies and absences. If you can't make it to school, you can't make it to practice. So you're trying to find out that. You're trying to find out about character. I don't, you know, this makes it sound wrong. I don't need the coach to tell me whether he can play or not. I have to make that decision. I don't get them all right, certainly. But what I do need to know is about the person that's where the high school coach can really come in or summer coach and be helpful. Hey, uh, can you talk a little bit about the different conferences that you have played in, or excuse me, that you've coached in uh, while down there at Missouri State? Well, we've uh, we've been in two since I've been here, Steve. We were in the mid-continent, candidly not a strong league. We were in there. My first year as head coach was 83. We had a conference tournament. That we were an independent in 83. We are in a conference tournament in 84. Then we joined the Mid-Continent in 85, and we were there through 1990. 1991 was our first year in the Missouri Valley Conference, and we're still in that league, uh, you know, in 2019. So we've had a long, good relationship with the Missouri Valley Conference. As, you know, ebbs and tides go, we've had a few of the teams leave over the years and replace them, but it's been a good league and a good geographical fit for us. uh, What's been your biggest rivalry? Um, well, I think I think in league it was Wichita State. Now they are no longer in our league. They've been out of the league a couple of years. I think they went to the American, and uh, they were a very, very nationally ranked competitive program for many years, and four hours away. So geographically, they were relatively close to us. And I think Dallas Baptist, which only Division One sport is baseball, and they got a very strong program, very committed in terms of resources, got a great coaching staff. So I would say currently Dallas Baptist is our biggest rival in the conference. Can you give me uh, maybe one or two of your fondest memories in your coaching tenure? Well, I would say uh, from a team standpoint, and, and some will be surprised because we were blessed, fortunate with a great team in 2003 to play in the World Series. That's certainly close to the top, but hosting a regional, Steve, is very, very hard to do in this business, and we were the, I think, sixth or seventh national seed. That's out of 300 teams in 2015, and and therefore we were able to host a regional at our field, filled up the stadium, 
was tremendous. The energy was unbelievable, and we won that regional at home. From a team standpoint, your goal every year is to play in the NCAA tournament, reset your goal, win the regional. We won three super regionals, and those have been highlights as well. And then, you know, from an athletic standpoint and watching your kids develop athletically, you certainly get excited when they have success in professional baseball. Six million car accidents and 38,000 carjackings occur each year in the U.S. You've taken all the precautions, but we know that accidents and incidents still happen. You're driving to baseball practice. You're taking a family road trip. What do you do when your seatbelt won't release? You smell gasoline or your safety is threatened? What's your plan to safely escape an accident or dangerous threat? Be prepared with Sabre's new Safe Escape automotive tool. The only three-in-one car tool of its kind. The Safe Escape features a seatbelt cutter to slice through malfunctioning seatbelts in seconds, a stainless steel glass breaker for speedy escape, and Sabre's maximum strength pepper gel with a range up to 12 feet and 25 bursts per canister. No matter where the road takes you, protect yourself, your team, and your loved ones with Sabre's Safe Escape. Available now on SabreRed.com. That's SabreRed.com. Coaches, get 10% off with offer code PLAYBALL. Can you, uh, can you share with me maybe one of your biggest disappointments? Well, in 2015, we hosted the regional and, and won it, and our seed, by virtue of where we were seeded nationally, allowed us to, if we won the regional, host the super regional. The problem was we, we share a double-A facility with the Cardinals, and this had nothing to do with the Cardinals. But they were at home that weekend, and they were willing to accommodate us, work with us, work around us, but the NCA had a rule that you cannot host a super regional or a regional at the same time the pro club is at home because they have concerns with weather and ESPN and logistical issues. So instead of hosting after we won, we had to go on the road. So that would probably be the biggest one. Now let's, uh, let's talk about this. What one thing do you wish you would have known when you started your career um, that you know now, what would have made it easier for you way back? Then? I don't know. If, I, I don't know. I, I, can I rephrase that a little, Steve? One, sure. One thing I would I would have probably, looking back after 37 years, done differently is probably be a little more calm and a little, a little more player friendly at the start of my career. I was very young and and uh, probably loud, emotional. Uh, and I think I've calmed down. I think it's helped our players. I think I've become a better coach through that maturity. And that kind of takes me into the, the and next question. And some may question. disagree. They still, may still think I'm loud and emotional, but <laughs> probably the umpires. No, no, I don't think so. Hey, uh, tell me this. Uh, over time, other than that, other than that, in that, in that realm of uh, officiating, how has your coaching style evolved over the years in terms of relating to players and so forth? I think it's a lot better. I don't think there's any question. I think when I started, I was, you know, I was very young. I was 27 as a head coach in Division One, and, you know, I wanted to make my mark, and I wanted to win, as we all do. But I was probably more concerned about winning at age 27 than I was maybe having great relationships with the players that were long-lasting. And after a while, you kind of figure it out. Wins are great. In, in, in the big scheme, you really need the relationships. And I think your success is more defined, can be defined by what happens after they leave you, how do they do in terms of as family men in the, in the community, and they stay in touch with you. You know, if your guys never call back or never come by or never play in alumni or golf games, you probably haven't done it very well. So that's, that's something we take some pride in is, is our guys staying in touch. Hey, what's the, the biggest difference? Um, for a young player uh, when they leave high school and they they begin their college experience what what do they what do they face what's the the biggest difference for them in the game or maybe the biggest challenge for them as they no, as I they think move into the college strength, world Steve is, is something that you know as, as you get older obviously your body matures so 
as a freshman, you could be 18 playing against 22 year olds, and there's a big difference there. Not unlike in high school, ninth grader playing against a 12th grader, or a guy in A ball out of high school playing against a big leaguer. I think the physical part, and then just a the college day can be very hectic and busy. You're going to class, you're going to practice, you're going to weights, you're going to study hall, and then you may have to study more on your own. It's a really, really busy day. You have to be organized, and you have to have a lot of discipline to be successful. Now, I uh, when I coached, I love practice. I love planning practice. I enjoyed the flow and the pace, you know, of a of a great practice. Can you describe your your practice planning process? You know, how much time do you spend on it preparing practice? Structure. Well, we do it fun? together, actually, as a staff, and I have some really good people. So we'll sit down really on Monday morning, and we'll go over the week, and we'll plan each day what we're going to do, and we'll get input from our pitching coach, from our hitting coach. You know, we you know we have to know with weather where are we going to be. We have access to turf fields and grass field. Are we traveling? What are our constraints that week? Do we have any academic conflicts? Then kind of go from there. In the fall, when we're out on the field for about five weeks, as the NCAA permits, Early in the week, it's more drill work and instruction. <clears throat> then usually Thursday, Friday in the fall, we'll go live with our pitchers and inner squads, some of them. Typical practice starts about 2.15 with our athletic trainer giving us a good stretch. Then a warm-up period. We might start with base running while the pitchers are doing bands or, or some other type of work. And usually we've got indoor training physically right at the stadium, which allows us to break up and do a lot of individual work and then you know we'll go into whatever type of batting practice we're doing that day in segments and might have two groups out on the field hitting another group in the indoor hitting or doing some some type of mobility work with our trainer then come back together and maybe finish up with some defensive drills and try and get out of we don't go four hours a day i think that's insane we're usually two and a half to three hours per day and it's up to us to be organized and get the work in can you uh from a college kid's perspective, uh, let's take the fall. What What is their day like? I mean, are they waking up early and doing weights and then the classroom and then practice? How, how does it look for them? Well, we don't do we don't do 6 a.m. weights here because we're fortunate we have the ability to access our weight room later in the day. So, you know, depending on the time, let's just say you've got an 8 o'clock class, so you're up hopefully eating breakfast, go to class for a few hours, maybe you're in the training room early, maybe you come down between classes and hit extra. And that's something we're, we have facility to do. Go back to class, maybe you get out at, let's just say you get out at one, you eat lunch. Our stadium is about two blocks from campus, Hammonds Field. You come down, you get some extra early work in. Maybe you see the trainer down there, meet with the coach, do some video, go into our indoor. We've got six cages in the indoor. Our hitters like to work extra there with our hitting coach and then we'll start our our formal practice and you know all freshmen have required a six hours of study hall until they earn their way out so practice is over depending on what day of the week it is could be a lifting day could go straight from the field let's say 5 15 over to the weight room lift with our strength coach you got to make sure you got your study hall hours in you might be meeting with a tutor and of course the academic schedule and and is is challenging as well and you've got to take care of your business or you don't play well that's a busy day every day that's the thing and that's you know that's a grind now you i didn't mention social work social work i didn't mention social life in there see but we know that's going to happen as well but you've got to take care of your business let's talk just for a second if we could about um, youth baseball you know, we we see kids. Uh, they're they're playing a lot of games, uh, doing some traveling on their own. What? Um, how do you assess youth baseball today? What's your, what's your thoughts on it? Well, I think practice certainly at a young age is something that's critical, and somebody with some background to teach correct fundamentals. And those fundamentals don't change from the time you're young to the time you get in college to the time you get in pro ball. They may be taught a little differently. Uh, there may be more to analyze them with or video them with now, but the fundamentals don't change, and you've got to have access to those. You know, baseball is a game 
of quality repetition. I think particularly from a hitting standpoint, you can't take a great athlete and at age 17 who hasn't played baseball ever in his life, oh, this guy's a great athlete. He ought to be able to hit. It doesn't work like that. I think the eyes have to see hundreds and hundreds of live pitches and get a feel for pitch recognition and what you need to do for body control to be able to be a good hitter. So, um, you know, not around the youth baseball, but you can learn from games, absolutely, 100%, but you've got to have somebody at the end of the game that's got a yellow legal pad and has written down all the things that have come up and take the time to go over it. And, you know, depending on the age, I don't know how captive an audience you you would have with that, but like any level, Steve, I'm sure there's some great youth coaches and some not so great probably could be said up through the major leagues. How would how would you uh... – are you okay with the number of games the kids are playing today? Well, I'm okay if they can stay healthy through that schedule and enjoy the game, look forward to the games, be encouraged to play the games, and handle correctly. If their bodies start to break down, too many games. You know, if, if the guy's throwing too many innings as a young man, it's too much. So there's, there has to be some control and there has to be effective leadership with these teams. Can you give me something that you wished uh, that maybe the youth coaches or even the high school coaches would do a better job with so when they get to you, you feel like, hey, hey this is the one area I wish that, that you would see improvement in? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. It's not something I think about real often, which I think is a real compliment to the coaches, certainly, that we have in our state of Missouri. and. You know, I I think on the whole, our high school coaches do a really good job. I see them at clinics. I was just at the National Clinic in Dallas a couple weeks ago, saw guys down there. and I think we have dedicated professionals here. You know, they have limited amount of hours, Steve. They have limited staff. They have limited facility. So, you know, I don't know if they can get to all – I mean, I don't think you're going to have a high school staff with a real hitting coach, pitching coach, and head coach be hard to do if you do you've got a heck of a staff but you know i I just think some of the smaller things that kids and you know this kids are going other places in the winter and i don't know how a high school coach deals with that that's a good question for you about you know they have their own hitting coaches they have their own pitching coaches and you've got to kind of deal with that and make that work for yourself but uh, i just say maybe some of the smaller details and when it's all over when it's all over and the um, kid leaves your program, what is it that you would like your players to remember uh, about playing for you? Well, I want it to be a good experience, an enjoyable experience, something they can look back on and be proud that they were a member of. And then I want them to like it enough where, again, they stay in touch with us and have a relationship for the long term. Hey, and can you also touch just for a second? You uh, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, your pitch recognition and, and what what you guys do with the kids. Can you talk to a little bit about how you would you would teach that to your kids? Well, we we do it a few ways. I mean, last year our operations guy kind of did a hybrid. We we had some pitching video, and we did it on laptops, and we would have our guys come in between classes. And he would play it and start out with a pitcher with his delivery and, and, and just watch the ball come in the zone. And then he would continue it and he'd shut it off where the ball was halfway to the hitting area. And you'd have to say if it was a strike or ball based on where it was when he turned it off. Next time he'll turn it off and you have to make a decision and answer correctly whether it was a breaking ball or a fastball. So we did that. And this year we've changed up a little bit. We've had Dr. Fatty who's with GameSense. He's been helpful to us. He's been over at uh, an event we had a few weeks ago and kind of uh, jumped on that and bad wagon a little bit. <clears throat> but we project, we have in our indoor facility, we project against a wall. And it's a good-sized picture of a lot. We have live pitching footage. And we have the pitcher throw. We have our hitter standing there probably 25 feet away from the wall guys pitching not to him but it's coming at him he'll take a pitch then the next time we've got him there with a batting tee and a ball on the tee 
pitch is delivered. He has to time it as to when he think it would be arriving, and he hits off the tee off the projection on the wall. And it's been – our guys like it. I think it's been a motivator and uh, something we've done this year, and I think we're going to see some benefit from that. You know, I, I think Peter Fatty has done a, a really good job with his program, and I, I think that's the next – that's the next biggest thing in hitting is um, is pitch recognition and and allowing our kids to actually learn how to do it and and advance their skills through it. Yeah, and you, the other part is, I mean, this may seem trivial, but you save wear and tear on guys' hands and their arms and their bodies. You know, one of the more common injuries you've seen in the last few years is is the hammering bone in the hand broken. Guys are just swinging so much and. You know, here you can get a lot of work in, and you don't have to get a hundred swings. Hey, listen, Keith, I just want to want to thank you. It's been great spending a few minutes with you. I uh, I really appreciate your time, and thanks so much for sharing your insights, you know, on on baseball and your ideas on coaching. And I certainly wish you the very very best of luck uh, this year. Saber pepper sprays have been keeping people safe for over forty three years. See how the number one most trusted brand used by police worldwide provides reliable protection when you need it most. Protect yourself, your family, with Sabre. Visit SabreRed.com. That's SabreRed.com. Coaches get 10% off with the offer code PLAYBALL. I really enjoyed our conversation with Keith Gutton, longtime head baseball coach at Missouri State University. I've known Keith for a long time and have nothing but respect for him and his program. I am so impressed with his resume, with the success he has had at MSU. Hey, one thing I wanted to mention is how Keith responded to the question, hey, when it's all over, what do you want your players to take from your program? And Keith mentioned that, yes, winning is important, but do your kids want to come back? Do they want to keep in contact with you? And I want to add to that, are we preparing them for their future after baseball? Are we helping them learn life lessons through baseball? Or are we just coaching baseball? I think it's really important that we look at this as an opportunity to help kids grow up. That's really what this is about. Well, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the interview, and I'd like to ask everyone to please share the link to this Coach Baseball Right podcast episode on Facebook and Twitter.